Ruler School is brought to you by Happy Little Hug Factory and these amazing patrons. Extra special thank you to guest lecturer patrons Brody Harris and Lance Albertson. Thank you for your support. Enjoy the video. Hey there guys, DMO73 here, bringing you another feature match for this week. Today I am playing a mono black Lucifer discard list that was designed by one of the players at my state's event, and Tyler is playing a quick cast variant of Chimimi designed by Paul Klute. Um, super interesting version of um, Chimimi, the whole idea was to help it be more optimized against Time Spinning Witch and make it so that more of Time Spinning Witch's stuff doesn't do much, because they're just casting everything on the end of your opponent's turn. Um, so yeah, it's just a very interesting concept. And then the Lucifer deck is a pretty standard discard package, um, but also has uh, some kind of mid-game removal pieces um, and kind of recursion pieces to kind of help keep it alive. Uh, so it looks like I'm gonna be going on the draw, finishing off our mulligans here, and then we'll have to see how it goes. The quick cast Chimimi list um, primarily just uses things like Kurura, um, a lot more violas, um, and more, uh, it doesn't use like the hippos or the beast engine um, to, again, make sure that it doesn't really have to care about what stones it's hitting against time spending which it can just do what it needs to do. First turn on my end is a skeleton horde. Solid first card. Double spirit stone for Tyler is absolutely excellent for him against the discard deck. Uh, if I'm not maining evil elemental uprising, this essentially means that at one point in time, he's gonna get to draw three cards, um, which is, not so great for me, considering how I'm trying to force him to be out of cards. And he gets to do that for free, whenever he wants. So paying two. You see he's already doing it this time, his hand's pretty dead, so he's gonna say, we'll go ahead and just do it right now. Um, draws two cards by stacking the two spirit stones, casts spirit meditation, picking the mode to draw a card, and then returning those two stones back into play recovered. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a particularly risky play for him if I happen to be mainboarding Evil Elemental Uprising, um, but as this is game one, it's probably not the case that I would be mainboarding it. Going into games two and game three, obviously he doesn't want to make this play super early, because if he was to try to do that and cast spirit meditation and get Evil Elemental in response, he's practically locked out of the game at this point being at zero stones but it does refill his hand deciding whether or not he wants to use anything after that he's going to go ahead and cast magic boomerang and then in response to the trigger to try to generate a skeleton token he's going to flash in lorite so obviously he's kind of projecting that he has a lorite seven disciples um which I don't necessarily mind too bad because I have a lot of instant speed removal and it would tap him out to do so. Um, so if he, I'm not really worried about it coming down next turn. I could also just sandstorm here if I was really concerned about it, um, but I kind of want to generate as much value as possible out of a sandstorm. This is especially true when you consider jet black wings, you know, sandstorm plus jet black wings is um, six damage to the, or eight damage to the board on his side. Hitting at Speaker Stone. Paying one to cast an Approaching the Truth to help kind of shape his hand a little bit more. Like I said, this version of Chimimi is very, very heavily based on this idea of trying to um, shape your hand appropriately without giving time spending which the opportunity. But when you don't have to worry about your stones getting locked, it gives you a lot more freedom to cast cards on your turn without being worried about being punished. Down comes the Viola, which is going to actually just pump up the Lorite. And he's just going to go ahead and swing in for three damage there. I'll take it. Go down to 37. Hitting a Stone of the Dark Castle here. Get a mystery counter. I am going to apologize as well for the video here real quick. I'm sorry for the graininess. We were in a little bit of a low light situation. I will also apologize for um, the fact that in the first game here, the camera is kind of sinking. We fix it, um, but I do apologize as that happens. Get to go ahead and energize here into the blazer, expecting there to be a Lorite Seven Disciples. Like, go, oh, might be the time to cast Blazer here, especially since he's tapped out. I could steal the lore at seven disciples and then generate a lot of value after the fact. Seeing his hand here is triple uh, fair spell, Scarless Agony, and then two winds of vitality. I'm gonna go ahead and take the lore at seven disciples and kind of leave him with a hand of not really too much. Um, the winds of vitality don't super help him too much because I can just use blazer to like block whatever he would try to pump up. And then if he uses the winds of vitality on it, I can just remove it from combat. Hitting another spirit stone. And 
Tyler is at a lot of big risk there, um, seeing as uh, I do play Glint of Insight, now I have access to his hand, and he has a lot of cards of duplicates in his hand. So Glint of Insight here could potentially steal three, four, five, six, you know, cards based on if he happens to draw into another Winds of Vitality, or if he has a cancel to be able to potentially stop anything, um, or doesn't have another cancel. I'll go ahead and take the six damage here. Pretty comfortable with it. And if he chooses to use the discards here, it takes me down in life, which is fine. But I'm playing Belial, so I don't mind being at lower life. And then it just means I have even more cards that I can just freely take out of his hand with the Glint of Insight. With the Glint of Insight. I'll block with the um, Blazer. When he swings with the Lorite. He just decides to let the Lorite die. We go to my turn. Calling stone, hitting a stone of the undead. Really wishing that I had hit a mystery counter here. Would have been really nice. Um, because I could have done double glint of insight very cheaply, followed up by a look of corruption and pretty much emptied his hand. But I'm going to go ahead and do look of corruption first. See if there might be a cancel spell somewhere in this hand. And I got lucky in the fact that there is, there was a Winds of Salvation in his hand, so I can pull that card. And now Glint of Insight is safe to rip the rest of his hand apart. And seeing how he's already used Spirit Meditation, it's pretty comfortable in ripping that hand apart, because he has to sacrifice stones in order to be able to replenish, which feels very good. So I can call Ferris Spell here and take three cards. If I had had access to a um, second Mystery Counter, I could have also called Winds of Vitality and left him with just Scarlet's Agony, which at that point is pretty back-breaking for him. I'll go ahead and try to swing the blazer, uh, or I think about trying to swing the blazer into the viola. This is straight up a misplay on my part, um, simply because of the fact that I know he has uh, the Scarlet's Agony, which I can cancel it, but I don't really think about the Winds of Vitality. So I say, well, let's go ahead and make you discard a card at random. So then Tyler does something silly here, and after I identify which card is which, he shuffles his hand, and so then I'm, you know, I'm like, wait a minute, I just identified which card is which. So we'll roll here. End up taking the Scarlet's Agony out of his hand, which feels pretty good. It's another way to prevent him from having to be able to replenish his hand. So if I had had a Glint of Insight here, uh, you know, the second Mystery Counter, um, to give Glint of Mystery, I could actually steal every single card in his hand here, which would have felt really good. Uh, swing into the Viola. Uh, he uses the Winds of Vitality to pump it up. Um, and I'm totally okay with that. So now that he's only at one card, though, I can pay two and cast a, um, a Zazel. So I didn't really mind losing the Blazer here. It might not have been the best play, but it was mainly to just get that extra card out of his hand. I can let the Azazel and start refilling my hand. Plus now I have a 910 Flyer, which is very hard for him to deal with. So Azazel picking the mode, obviously, that when she enters, I look at the top two cards, send one card to the graveyard, and then put the other one in my hand. So a little bit of hand shaping on my end. Calling his fifth stone here. Paying five to cast Elephant Rush. So he gets those three 10 10 tokens. This is also another risky play against a darkness deck because if I have black tears, uh, I can just immediately kill all three of them for two will, especially since I also have access to Demon Division in the, in the rune deck. Um, calling for stone, hitting another magic stone of um, the undead. Sorry for the quick edit here. Um, I actually did what I was just talking about in terms of casting Demon Division to try to go search for a Black Tears, but uh, I was a little unfamiliar with the deck at the time, and, and the deck isn't actually mainboarding Black Tears, so we kind of took a step back. Um, 
and I appreciate Tyler being willing to let me take that step back. Playing a Joan to Arc here. And then passing the turn over to Tyler. I still have access to Jet Black Wings, and I believe I'm at 5 will, so I have 3 floating will to be able to deal with the Jet Black Wings, and having already answered 3, um, three of the... Uh, fair spells it feels pretty comfortable to be able to cast that card Tyler trying to decide if he wants to sacrifice some spirit stones or how he wants to address the situation. Pays one to cast uh, the rapid fire me. Which deals 400 damage and then he's going to go ahead and do sandstorm. So this will kill my Jonda arc. 600 damage to all resonators on the board. Then pays two more uh, to force me to sacrifice a creature with ruin story. Which will get rid of the... Um, Azazel. In response, though, I'm going to go ahead and cast Jet Black Wings to deal minus six, minus six to the board um, to try to minimize the damage, steal the viola, um, and make it so that all of the um, elephants are only going to be able to deal four damage to me instead of ten. Especially knowing that he has the Winds of Vitality in his hand, if I hadn't done that now, um, then it actually would have just been lethal, because he could have swung with all three, and then pumped one of them up with Winds of Vitality, and then that's game. He's going to go ahead and cast um, Approaching the Truth, to try to see if he can shape his hand a little bit better. And at that point, seeing that he doesn't have any way to grab anything else, he's just going to go ahead and deal the 12 damage to me, taking me down to 19. Going to go ahead and give the, um, after having finally hit the second mystery counterstone, give um, Glint of Insight the remnant and cast it. Seeing if he has any response to the cast. Did get a discard off of it. I think I called Lorite. Call Black Rosario here. Uh, and then now that he's down to just one card in hand. Yes, I do recognize the Glint of Insight does need to be moved to the RFG. I do catch it. Playing the Azazel. Which I actually honestly misplayed this whole situation. Um, what I should have done was played the Azazel first. After getting him down to one card. Forcing him to choose between one of the two tokens. And then playing the... Um, uh, the... Black Rosario, which would force him to uh, have to kill the other one. Instead, I get two Look of Corruptions, I cast the Look of Corruption, and in response, he just casts the Ruin Story to kill my Azazel. Um, so that was definitely a turn where I could have played that much differently in order to kind of re-establish, getting rid of all three of those tokens, even if he had a hand, still being at 19 life, um, 
puts me in a much better position. At this point in time, if he does have access to a single Winds of Vitality, which I know he does, uh, I believe this turn he has lethal, or I think I actually call Winds of Vitality with the Glint of Insight. Um, so like the play line here, if he still had it, would be to flip Jimmy and then just Winds of Vitality up the um, Elephant to deal 20 damage. Instead, he's going to try to dig his hand a little bit more by playing the fairy and then paying one more green to sacrifice it to draw a card. I'm just paying two will to draw a card. Playing um, Approaching the Truth to draw two cards. Sorry, it's hard to see because of the, again, the tilting camera. It's going to get fixed here in just a second. And just like that, we're back. Chooses to sacrifice some spirit stones here to try to refill his hand. Play Winds of Vitality. Hits me for 16, takes me down to 300 life. And then passes the turn. It looks like he has double Ruin Story in his hand. Um, he does catch that he forgets to call for stone, and I go ahead and let's say, I go ahead and allow him to call for the stone. Um, that happens here in just a little bit. Hitting a Magic Stone of Corruption. Paying three will here, cast a Belial. Giving him that one will turns out to be really relevant because that's a Lorite to cancel the Belial trigger. I'm pretty okay with it though because just a Belial existing on the board is also just really helpful. Um, I still haven't used Sandstorm yet, so I'm thinking he only has one card in hand. Let's go ahead and kill the Lorite outright. Uh, he will take 100 damage here. He should be down to 39. I don't think we catch it though, because of Belial's triggers. So I apologize if the life totals are a little off. Playing an Oberozuki on a weekend. And at that point I just pass the turn. Is two will here. Cast a ruin story, forcing me to sacrifice a creature. Totally comfortable with that. I say I'll just get rid of the Oberozuki. That was the main reason why I played it, was just in case there was the ruin story. Casts the Lorite Seven Disciples to give it swiftness. I say in response to trying to give it swiftness, we'll go ahead and deal a Life Severing Blade to kill it. Should have honestly killed the um, the elephant token, which would have been much smarter because uh, it's dealing more damage. And then he has to, you know, choose to not swing in the. Um, he also should take one damage here, so he should be out of 38. Once again, I apologize for the life totals being off. Realizes he has the uh, whirlwind technique that he could have used there, so it's a little bit of a misplay. The other reason why I played the uh, Oberozuki was because I had the Life Severing Blade, so knowing if there was some kind of spot removal in the form of something like Ruin Stories, um, Ober the Life Severing Blade would only cost one. Playing an Azazel here, because he only has the one card in hand. Tyler starts to pick the token off the board, and I go, I'm not picking the mode to make you sacrifice anything. I'm picking between two cards. I believe I grab a life severing blade here. Oh, no, I grab a revival of the clans um, to bring back the blazer from my graveyard. I think this is what I grab. Oh, 
I don't want to just grab a second of Zazel. Hit a look of corruption. And I can't quite tell what that other card is. Maybe a gene. So at this point in time, you know, knowing that he said so few cards, um, and being at only 300 life, the whole point is to slam as many big things on the field as possible, uh, and then kind of protect them with spot removal, um, so that, or, or you know, or force discards as much as possible. Swinging in 12 here, finally taking him down to 28, should be actually 26, because of the two creatures that died while Belial was on the field. Leaving up three will um, for a... Uh, A potential quick cast full cost um, life severing blade based on what might get played here Tyler going into his top deck card it's just one card Shamimi his whirlwind technique and then um, the elephant token can refill his hand if he chooses to with the spirit stone so potentially getting more cards out of it that way um, but really not looking too good. It would essentially be an all-in strategy at that point, and if it for some reason happened to fail, um, he'd pretty much be handing the game over at that point. Choosing to pay five to flip Chimimi here. And paying one more to play the fairy, so he has a flyer. He's attempting to swing in for 14, at which point I will use that hard cast life severing blade to kill it, which would then trigger and take him down to 25 at this point. Again, the error in the life totals. Either way, though, if I have some way to get rid of that fairy, the two is Zazel's and the Belial is lethal. Um, I just have to have some kind of way to get rid of the. Uh, the fairy and I have de access to demon division um, so I can just cast demon division and then swing in to kill him chooses to take the damage from the first Azazel goes down to 19 would be 16 playing six to do a um, awakened Oberozuki to kill all J rulers and I'm gonna sacrifice um, the Azazel to give a blood counter, which would then deal another 100 damage, taking him down to 15. Cast the Demon Division to go grab a Life Severing Blade. I can use the Life Severing Blade then for one, because I've sent a creature to the graveyard. Um, tries to block. Actually, just let it go through. So take him down to 14. And then leave one open. It's a little bit of a misplay on my part there. Not with only having one card in hand that Tyler can really do much. Um, like, but again, he does have access to Spirit Stones and a total of six will. Um, so there are still definitely some options available to him. Unfortunately, he doesn't have anything to play. Just passes the turn. Using the Stone of Corruption to attempt to get him to discard that last card. In response, he's going to go ahead and cast it as the Viola. Just flashes it into play. Ultimately, what would have been a smarter position would have been to just pay five and flip Lucifer, uh, which I just do here. Uh, wouldn't have cost me a stone, um, and I would have had the same situation. I've had two more, three more will available. The Belial's gonna swing, gets blocked by the the uh, Viola, in swings in the Zazel, and then in swings in the um, Oberozuki. So technically, with the damage that would be dealt by Belial, honestly, we have both been missing it in this first game. Um, this would actually be lethal. That last swing from Boborzuki would have killed him. Um, but as the two of us are not smart, uh, we missed that. So be careful and remember that Belial says whenever a creature is sent to the graveyard, your opponent takes 100 damage. So 
So the swing for Momo Suzuki puts him down to, at our counts, 200, but he should definitely be dead at this point. Drawing into his turn, he has access to a grand total of four, going into five will. He's going to go ahead and quick cast in a Lorite during the upkeep with the one will he had available still. Then he can recover, call a stone. I did happen to see a Lorite's Seven Disciples. So it's a good reason at that point that I had the Lucifer. Because um, again, honestly, that would have been misplaying myself out of the game. Go ahead and cast the Lorite's Seven Disciples. Give it all of the effects. Swing in the air. Lucifer does have flying. So we'll get to gate nine. Um, but then on the crackback, it's just lethal. Belial by himself is enough to, commit, to finish the game. Pass the turn, go to my turn, recover, and then just swing everything in. So we go on to the next game. As we transition to the next game here, please go ahead and check out the Patreon down below. It helps to go to support the channel with lots of cool perks. You can also buy Force of Will swag at the Ruler School spread shirt down below. And be sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell to be notified when all of our videos go live. Thank you guys so much, and let's go on to the next game. So game two, both of us recognizing that we need to play a little bit smarter. Um, definitely made some misplays on both of our instances. Um, and need to not count out the oppressive power that can be um, Lorite Seven Disciples, uh, on my end anyway. And then Tyler, I think, being needing to be very remembrant of what he has in his rune deck in terms of whirlwind technique to keep himself safe from the spot removal. Um, but also keeping in mind... Um, what life total he needs to keep me at in order to make things expensive. Stopping Lucifer decks or the decks that play Belial at 1100 life until you're able to kill them is very smart because at that point in time Belial still costs a lot of will. Going into my turn, casting that first turn look of corruption, gonna take the ruin stories and then energizing for the glint of insight to seal the two Solarite seven disciples. Feels really good taking three cards for two cards. Um, on his first turn and then I'm gonna go ahead and say let's go ahead and force it we'll make you discard a card here um, evens and odds and we hit the winds of vitality so leaving him with just a viola after the end of his first turn um, he does have access to a spirit stone the hope here being that he doesn't see two spirit stones because um, if he sees the second spirit stone um, which he doesn't need to see speaker stone then it makes forest meditation not as good to cast here which gives me more and more time to kind of keep on advantage um, just uses the past to turn there and makes sense he has the viola he probably plans to quick cast it in at the end of turn hitting the magic stone of corruption on my side playing a skeleton horde and saying pass out sees the viola at the end of his turn my turn Colin Stone hitting that second Spirit Stone. Um, once again, if we were playing in a tournament, this would probably not be a move that I would consider playing right now, unless I had access to a fair... Uh, I wouldn't consider playing this move right now. Um, but um, we typically play uh, unsideboarded games here on the channel, uh, so I don't have access to a um, Evil Elemental Uprising in the main deck to be able to punish it. Um, he's going to go ahead and use the mode to bring the Lorraine Seven Disciples back to his hand and then get the two stones back. So he gets to replenish his hand and bring back one of the threats that I removed with the um, Glint of Insight. Super not fun for me. Casting in a Viola to swing in for eight with the other Viola. Eight in the air so I can't block it. Hitting that Magic Stone of the Undead. the end of the turn flashing in that Lorite, which is going to make the Lorite Seven Disciples that much stronger. Getting that fourth wind source. Casting the Lorite Seven Disciples. I say in response to the cast, I'll try to use Jet Black Wings. The purpose here being... Um, 
kills everything and forces Lorite Seven Disciples to be a 1-1. Uh, he does have the Ferris spell, so it's a hard punish. So, swings in for 9, goes up to 49, takes me down to 23, and gets to swing in with both the Viola and the um, Skeleton Horde. And I say, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and take all that damage, taking an additional 12, taking me down to 11. Um, Tyler being very smart, keeping me at 11 life instead of having to go to... Um, 10, that one more damage from Lorite would actually just be enough to kill me. It would be enough to force a Belial play crack pack, which he can't answer. It would be really bad for him at this point in the game. Because he stopped at 11, I don't have the will to be able to cast a Belial. And having lost access to my Jet Black Wings, um, in pretty bad shape. So I'm going to go ahead and swing in uh, for 4 damage to get the Skeleton Horde here. Play... Uh, Sandstorm for free, which will deal two damage to the Viola that has four damage, and then two damage to the Lorite. At that point, forcing him down to only two creatures, and I can cast Black Rosario to get them both off the board. So, still only able to use two will, and I did clear the board for it, which is helpful. And then I say, you know what, let's go ahead and you only have two cards left in your hand. Let's force you down to only being at one card in left in hand. Um, but I didn't have a follow up there. Oh no, I had already cast the discard spell. My apologies. So the last rune on my list is Demon Division at this point. Goes ahead and casts to play the Elephant Rush. And without access to um, being the Belial to be able to answer them, without access to the Black Tears to be able to answer them, um, and only being at five will. So even a hard cast Belial here would be pretty awesome because it'd get rid of all three of them. Um, I'd lose my skeleton token, but I would still have Belial, which would be great. You see, I do have that Belial in my hand. So it's a matter of if I can try to stay alive long enough to kill enough things to be able to live. Casting the Oborozuki, sacrificing the skeleton token to be able to make it an 8-8. At that point in time, just using the Life Severing Blade. And the other life severing blade to answer two of the elephants. Going into his turn. Calling for a stone here. Tyler very much in control of this game. Um, he probably doesn't want to swing until he has a way to answer the Oborozuki and then push through for that extra 100 damage. Even something as simple as a Viola gets him there. He's going to pay one to produce one green and then sacrifice the Spirit Stone to draw a card. Magic Boomerang also to give the... Um, Elephant flying. And then pays one more to cast the um, stuff to deal six damage. Oh, he's using the mode to deal f the deal the damage to her instead, instead of giving it flying. Um, that's because she has flying. And so having the Winds of Vitality, getting her out of the way, um, just it means that I don't have an answer for it, and he gets to get in for 16 damage. So now we go into game three. Um, Moving pretty quick here, going ahead and casting that first turn look of corruption, trying to get a handle on what the hand is. Uh, choose to steal the fairy away. He's got a Karura, a ruin story. Neither of those really matter to me too much right now. Mainly wanting to get rid of his potential turn one play. And even there saying, you know what, let's go ahead and try to get rid of his second card here while we still have the chance. Getting the two, hitting the uh, approaching the truth, which is excellent for me. Um, because now he also doesn't have a way to fill, to shape his hand as much. Uh, and if he doesn't see those um, spirit stones early, uh, then I can potentially set up for a very big lead. Choosing to pass the turn, I hit a second stone of corruption here. Casting a skeleton horde. Using the pass the turn there, causes the second stone, or causes the second stone hits that spirit stone, and passes the turn back. 
third stone of corruption for me. Choosing to pass back the turn to him. He flashes in a um, viola at the end of his turn. Recovers, calls for a stone. Hits that second spirit stone here. So he says, we're going to do it. We're going to make the plays. Once again, having not done any sideboarding, I'm choosing not to try to punish it in any way. Um, once again, for those of you at home, if you're playing against any kind of darkness deck and you're in a sideboarded game, don't try this unless you feel very certain that they don't have access to Evil Elemental Uprising. Um, because in this situation, if Tyler had done this, sacrificed the two Spirit Stones, wasted those two Floating Wheel to cast Spirit Meditation, and been Evil elemental he would have been back down to just... Um, he would have been back down to just one stone and energize, which would have been really bad for him. He swings in with the viola. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, block it with the um, skeleton horde. Go to my turn, hit another stone, paying four. Thinking about playing four, and then I remember there's a ruin stories there. I'm trying to cast the blazer, but he does have access to black or green. I say let's be smart about this. We'll go ahead and cast Glint of Insight. Try to steal the Ruined Stories out of his hand. Or if he casts Ruined Stories in response here, whatever he grabs, I can just call that instead. He's going to flash in the Lorite. Um, and then... I guess I chose something not one of the cancel spells, which I think is suboptimal. Um, oh, I chose Lorite as the card because I didn't want to have a quick cast Lorite into a Lorite Seven Disciples. Um, he has access to the Ruin Story, so he could buy it back, um, but that does uh, cost a lot of will for him to be able to do so and kind of taps him out. Um, it doesn't give him the most optimal of his plays. Now I know though that there's a Ferris spell, a Ruin Story, and a Winds of Salvation. There are three different cancels that I have to try to answer before I can start ripping his hand apart again or casting any really big creatures, um, which is a pretty big hurdle for a discard deck. Um, well, it would, can be a pretty big hurdle for a discard deck, especially when the deck that you're also facing is throwing a lot of aggression your way. Um, it's one of the things that makes Jimmy, I think, really good in this format is that she can control the board while also applying a ton of pressure early game that if you don't answer is just really punishing. Before uh, recovering his turn, flashing in the viola to give the other viola flying, gets that spirit stone. Swings in the air for eight, takes me down to 32, and I say that's fine. Swings in the air for four, I say that's fine, go down to 28. Jet Black Wings is a card that I really want to use against Tyler. The problem is I can't, um, I kind of need to bait out those cancels. And I say, you know what? I think about it here during the upkeep to try to tap him out um, to kind of follow that, but doing a lot of plays here, just forcing the Jet Black Wings, potentially seeing the cancel cast, tapping out Tyler and then getting to recover. I'm gonna go ahead and try to cast it here. The thing is, again, he has that fair spell and I think this is a misplay on my part for sure. Because of the fact that Jet Black Wings has um, Quick Cast, he can just use the Ferris Spell instead, which doesn't tap him out at all. I steal, I spent three will and a board wipe, potential board wipe during the upkeep uh, to steal a one cost spell, um, which is definitely a pretty poor trade, especially now that I don't have access to that board wipe later um, when it could really matter. Because 600 uh, defense um, in Chimimi decks is surprisingly relevant, and then you make it at 800, and you can pretty much clear everything that they have off the board because of the Sandstorm. Casting Black Rosario here, saying, please discard two, or sacrifice two creatures. Interesting that he chooses not to use, a di to, um, use the Winds of Salvation here. Um, casting an Arrival of the Pack. Um... Or revival of the pack and then getting the skeleton horde back to then immediately recast the skeleton horde just trying to play a little defensive here 
You see that low right come down, bring the upkeep, which means that there's probably a Disciples coming down quickly afterwards. Hang three. All right, seven disciples, gonna swing in for that nine in the air, can't stop it. Take nine, gain nine. 1900 to 4900. Swing in for six. Block with the skeleton, or block with the skeleton token. The main reason to block with the skeleton token there instead um, is that if I block with the skeleton token, um, if I block with the Skeleton Horde, it creates a second token, which he can just do Sandstorm for free and kill both tokens off the map. I'm going to go ahead and flip over Lucifer here. This is definitely a stall tactic. I want to try to rip his hands to shreds since he's already done Spirit Meditation. Acknowledge the fact that um, he's going to gain another set of life, um, but I can use Lucifer to kind of buy me a turn. Clear his hand out, buy a turn off of the Disciples, take a little bit of damage from the Viola, feel comfortable with that. Um, potentially block it with the Skeleton Horde. Uh, and then um, be able to kind of reestablish myself as having a full hand versus him not having a hand really because he's already used the spirit meditation and he'd have to sacrifice stones at that point in order, in order to reestablish. Discards the Karura, the Ruin Story, and the Fair Spell. So at this point in time, I know the card in his hand is Winds of Salvation. I'll go ahead and cast the Sandstorm here, which he could Winds of Salvation too, but the only thing it's going to kill is the Lorite. And then I'll go ahead and swing the uh, Skeleton Horde into the Viola to kill that off the board as well. So feeling pretty confident about this turn. Um, if he had used the Wind of Salvation on the Sandstorm, then all that happens at that point is um, I simply uh, don't swing the Skeleton Horde into the Viola, leave it recovered. Um, still get to steal the Lorite at that point in time with Disciples, unless the top card he draws happens to be a Lorite, Disciples is not gonna be nearly as impactful, um, which feels very good. Hitting another Spirit Stone here for Tyler. Casts the Sandstorm to kill the token. He chose to make um, Lorite Seven Disciples a 9-9. Uh, nine -nine. Um, you might be wondering why I didn't just choose to take that damage. Because he has access to so many Spirit Stones, if I had chosen to take the damage there from the 9-9, nine -nine, it's very possible that he could have chosen to go all in on the Spirit Stones and drawn into, say, Double Winds of Vitality and just killed me. Um, playing the second Lorite to Seven Disciples here gives it Swiftness, takes me down to 12. Pay four here to cast the Blazer. Really trying to bait out the Winds of Salvation, removing it from the game. Now that he's out of cards in his hand, I can use the Azazel to force him to pick between the two All Right Seven Disciples. Um, I really wanted to make sure. So it was four will essentially to, you know, Blazer did what he wanted to do and it forced the cancel out because the Azazel was the card that I really needed to resolve. Um, forcing there to only be one Lord Seven Disciples that even if it's plus nine, plus nine, isn't going to be able to kill um, Azazel. Even if it gets flying, Azazel can block it. Even if it gets drained, Azazel will still kill it. Even if it has first strike, Azazel will still kill it. Um, Azazel is a very good, because of that extra 100 defense, it's a very good card against Lorite. Seven Disciples. He's gonna go ahead and pay five and do Judgment. He says, well, if I'm just gonna have to flip it anyway. Chooses to give it Drain, I believe. He's gonna pay one more, cast the Winds, uh, cast the Fairy. Swings in with the Lorite, Seven Disciples. I think he chose, yeah, I gave it Drain. And I say he's tapped out to do this. So it puts me down to 100 life. So because it'd be an 11-11, I will go ahead and accept that damage. Goes to my turn. Now Belial is alive, which is excellent because I'm only at 100 life. Uh, and Shimimi doesn't have a way to like ping damage to face. He has to deal damage to me. So I get to play this Belial for only three. 
Belial at that point will get to kill both the Lord Seven Disciples and the Fairy, uh, unless he chooses in response to um, pay one to sacrifice it for a card, but I don't think he has any will available. Um, so then he'll take two. Oh, he is going to use the Energize to draw a card off of it. He'll still take two damage, go down to 58, because we are going to hit it, remember it this time. And now feeling very much back in control of this game state. Even at only 100 life, um, being able to start casting Belial's for super cheap um, feels very, very good. Casting in the Blazer here now that he's drawn a card. So go ahead and steal that card from his hand. It's a Scarlet's Agony. The Blazer is also nice here because um, it can prevent itself from being removed from combat. You know, remove something from combat. Um, you know, it can do a lot of different things. Protect, protect itself as well. Pays five here to just go ahead and cast Elephant Rush. So they're 14, 14 elephants. That point in time passes the turn to me. Calling for a stone, hitting a, another mystery stone, stone from the Dark Castle. So now I have access to two mystery counters. Swinging with the blazer, he blocks with the elephant. I say that's fine. He takes 100 damage, goes down to 57. And then just pay three to cast another Belial and steal all three tokens that way. Um, dealing 600 damage to him, taking him down to 51. Because now that there's two Belials on the board, everything will deal 200 damage to him if he dies. If it dies. Paying one more for a, or two more for a Jean. Now that I have three creatures on the board, Jean's indestructible. Playing that Skeleton Horde. Um, and then going ahead and swinging in for nine with the Azazel, taking him down to 42. Still living up to Will to be able to potentially cast um, the Life Severing Blades if needed. It's going to go ahead and cast Approaching the Truth during the upkeep here. Sees that Winds of Vitality. Doesn't really do him too much against this board state. I'm very comfortable just throwing Gene under the bus. And there's no way for him to um, deal enough damage to answer the board and prevent Gene from being indestructible. And I do have access to flyers, which is great. Decides to go ahead and just pass the turn there. Use the remnant. Cast Glint of Insight. I think I attempt to call Lorite. Seeing if he has a response before the cast. Because Glint of Insight is called at resolution. Um, there was no Lorite in his hand, just a Disciples and a Viola. So I'll go ahead and cast the second one from my hand and steal the Disciples out of his hand. Leaving him with just a Viola, which I can easily answer. Playing another Azazel to kind of fix my hand a little bit. Seeing a life severing blade. Um, casting Look of Corruption here to force him to cast the Viola right now. Demon Division, filter, filter my hand a little bit better. I think I search for another Life Severing Blade here, either that or a second Gene. It is indeed the second Gene. So feeling pretty comfortable that Tyler's not gonna be able to really get through this wall of defense that I've suddenly acquired, um, even to get that 100 life. So I'm gonna go ahead and start swinging. Swing in for nine with the Azazel. So that's fine, I'll take it. And at that point, I pass the turn. Swings in for six with Viola. Block it, or sorry, for 20, 10 with Viola. He's gonna go ahead and uh, Winds of Vitality to kill it. He'll take two damage from that, go down to 31. 
Although he was going to kill it anyway because of the pump from Chimimi. Passes the turn there to me. No cards in hand. Has a lot of will to be able to sacrifice with the spirit stones. Calling for another stone. Hitting a stone at the dark castle. Swinging the Azazel into, or the Belial into the Viola to kill it. Um, dealing him two damage for sending it to the grave. And then just passing the turn there. Or no, he, yeah, just passing the turn. I think it's because I feel completely confident. Uh, and I kind of want to finish the game off in a little bit of a flashy way. Uh, I don't recommend doing that if you're playing in any kind of tournament. If you feel like you have a solid win, just take it. Um, don't waste your time. Um, because you could easily misplay yourself. Uses Magic Boomerang here to kill my token. He'll take two damage from that. In comes the token. Passes the turn to me. Calling stone. Getting another stone of the Dark Castle. Looking at what I have in the graveyard. Swinging the Azazel for 9, take him down to 18. Swinging him for 9 with the other Azazel, take him down to 9. Or sorry. Or sorry, the that's not an Azazel, that's a um the knight. The knight there keeps coming back. Disgrace knight. Um swing at him with Gene, he blocks it. Swing at him for 7 with the other Gene. Swing my Belial into his Chimimi to kill it. He'll take one damage from the Belial dying. Casting Ping 1 to cast uh, Return of the <laughs> Clan, Arrival, or Revival of the Clan. Um, Awaken, bringing back Belial and this Skeleton. Paying for the Skeleton and then the Belial, which will nuke one, two, three creatures and deal six damage to Tyler to win the game. So very flashy, completely unnecessary, but lots of fun. Huge thanks to Tyler. Tech profiles, as always, will be up later this week. And until then, this is DMO73, signing off.